Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I think you just about can hear me. Great to see you all. And a very, very warm welcome from me to uh, the King's School Canterbury. It is brilliant to see you here today. My name is Miss Lawson. I'm the, the head of King's Canterbury. In fact, I've just joined as head this term. So I'm so pleased to be welcoming you to the school um, and to be... Um, with you celebrating this fantastic event taking place here today. Now this event for me combines a number of things that I, I like to see. First of all, we've got a great sense of collaboration between lots of schools and I'm really, really keen that we do all we can here at King's Canterbury to work with our local schools, to work with our local community, um, to share our resources, but also to learn from each other. And today is all about that. It's all about collaboration. It's all about working together and it's all about learning from each other. And the other thing that I love about this event is that it is very much a student-led event. I think in schools, the best things will always be those projects, those activities that are guided by you as pupils, as students. And I'm always eager to make sure that we're enabling you, we're supporting you, where you have ideas, where you have projects, we help you to get them off the ground. Now, of course, the Young Scientist Journal has been going for 10 years now. This is a really well-established project. It keeps going from strength to strength, and we have a fantastic programme of events happening here today, which Mr Green will speak more about in just a moment. And it's a special year for us here as a school when it comes to science as well. We have just opened our brand new science labs um, over in the Mint Yard, and I'm so delighted that we're able to share those with you today and see them in use for what promises to be such an exciting day of events. Mr. Green is going to talk in a bit more detail now about what we've got coming up today, but I do wish you all a fantastic day. Thank you so much for joining us and being involved in this project, and I can't wait to see what you get up to um, with us in our labs today. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. Well, thank you. Good morning. And thank you all so much for coming. Some of you some distance. So it's lovely, lovely to see you all here for what uh, proves to be a very, very interesting and good day. We've got some fantastic speakers lined up from a whole different field of science, which is really, really exciting. I'm just going to go through some boring housekeeping bits that are important and just sort of talk you through the structure of the day, what's happening and what's happening when. Um, first is fire. If there is a fire drill if, or a, a fire emergency, if the alarm goes off, um, our meeting point is on Green Court. You'll be led there by student teams, by student helpers, um, but it's the big patch of green grass all the way out there. So if you go out to Shirley Hall, turn right, follow along, and you'll get to the green court there. Stay in your school groups, and your teachers can register you and make sure you're here. And I have an idea of numbers here as well. Um, we've got a series of talks throughout the day. They're each about 40 minutes long. After the first break, we split into two groups, okay? So if... Um, Dover Grammar School, Kent College and Langton Girls, after the break you'll be going to the school room where you'll be shown where to go by some of our students um, and you'll have two talks there and then you'll go for lunch and then you'll go for um, the talk in session six after that. And um, Langton Boys, the Judd School and Canterbury Academy, you'll go to the science auditorium and you'll have um, three talks there and you'll then have the second lunch break and then we all come back in here afterwards for the final talks and to finish off the day. Um, I think that's all I really need to say at this stage. Um, I'll hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Ben Gelt, who's going to talk about the brain and um, binary for that. So we look forward to that. Thank you all very much indeed. Hey, um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you, um, James and the organizers and you guys for selecting me to to give a talk. What I'd like to present is some of our recent research, which is on something which wasn't what I, it was, I'm not a neuroscientist by training, but we accidentally discovered something which I think points to um, something really spectacular, which I'd like to share with you. And that's the discovery of um, molecules which have got memory. So these molecules can remember um, information in a binary format. And these protein molecules are actually what holds our brains together, leading to this idea that maybe there's a binary code in our brains. That sounds a bit far out there, especially first thing on a Wednesday morning, but I'd like to give you a bit of background to this and why I think it's true, and then hopefully have a discussion on how, what the implications of this would be if we can prove it. So in the middle of this screen, I don't know if I've got a laser pointer. 
No, maybe not. But in the middle of this screen, we've got this protein called tailin. This is what we work on. And um, it's, I'll, I'll show you a bit more detail on it now. Um, but from the youngest child, from um, a kid who's just started, like, right through to the oldest adult, everybody knows where information's stored, where, our, where we do all our thinking. It occurs in our brains. And the electrochemical signaling which goes round in that brain activity, we all have an understanding of this. And if we looked at this baby's brain in detail, what we would see is millions and millions of neurons, uh, which are the brain cells, all talking to each other by sending these electrochemical signals. And this is really complex. This is well established. But what's not so well established is where is the actual information in this? Is it just in the electrochemical signaling? Or is there something underpinning the, um, where the information resides? And this is incredibly complex. We're nowhere near understanding these electrical circuits. But what we've discovered is that this, when we see these, um, where these neurons are talking to each other, they make these connections called synapses where one neuron talks to another and it can send signals across this um, tight junction here. These are always drawn like this, just floating in space, free and all, like two halves of a coconut. But in reality, that's not what's going on here. These are in, 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 inextricably linked. And they're linked via this really complex scaffolding. So this is held together because there's a scaffolding both around it and inside it. And a bit similar to this lighthouse where that, this scaffolding is holding it while they do the repairs. But what we've found out is that that scaffolding holding these synapses together is built of these memory molecules. It's built of these binary switches. That's what I would like to just present as an idea to you guys today and hopefully leave time for questions because it opens up a few interesting possibilities, um, I think. So the reason why that is, I'm going to skip straight to a video because this illustrates what I'm going to talk about, but then I'm going to talk about how we discovered this, is that these proteins, these scaffold proteins, are mechanically active. If you apply a small amount of force onto these, you can open these um, switches. So these switch domains open and close in response to me mechanical signals. So that electrochemical signaling going around the brain is switching on tiny motor proteins inside all of our cells. And those, cell those motor proteins pull on these molecules. That's the idea I want to try and show you um, today and how we got to that. Um, but just to say that this these are switches, they can have two states, either a folded or an unfolded state. So we've got two states, a zero or a one. This is binary information being written into the shape of this molecule. And it led to this idea, once, we, once I was working on these memory molecules, and then as I started to look where they are and found that they're holding our brains together, every single synapse is, is held by these memory molecules. And if you delete the memory molecules, you don't have any synapses. None of the neurons talk to each other. So they're a, a fundamental part of these circuits in our brain. And it led to me writing this paper a couple of years ago now in 2021. But I just want to go back 10 years because I didn't start as a neuroscientist. What we were interested in was, I don't know if it's going to play. Ah, there. We're interested in this. Does anyone want to have a guess what that, what's going on in this picture? I don't know if you ask questions in these auditoriums. So this is, this is two cells. These are fibroblasts. They're skin cells. They, they're what crawl under our skin. If any, hopefully you're all too young to have tattoos. But if you have a tattoo, these can um, be what um, takes up the color. But this cell is, if the, if the monitor was working properly, he's crawling along. Oh, let me know. Is crawling along in a really ordered fashion. We wanted to understand this process. How can a cell crawl in such an organized fashion? And the reason it's crawling is because it's making these large assemblies which are in green. And this is where this cell physically grabs on to um, an underlying cargo net called an extracellular matrix. So all of our cells in our body, we're not just a massive pile of cells on the floor. We've got tissue, we've got organs, we're organized. And how that organization occurs it's because our cells are connected to this extracellular matrix and to each other. And that's where the order comes from to give rise to an organism. And this is really, this cell is physically pulling itself along that cargo net. And in doing so, it's, it's, it's getting to where it needs to go. And why we were interested in this was because it's, it's essential for the development of multicellular life. The adhesion molecules we're going to talk about occurred at the, at the advent of multicellularity. 
but it also goes badly wrong in many different diseases. If you have a cell which suddenly becomes migratory and starts to crawl around the body, that's a really bad thing which can happen. So we're interested in understanding this. And just to give an example of that this is computation we're talking about, and I mean in terms of like working stuff out and actually doing sums, there's a really beautiful experiment. Does anyone know what a stem cell is? Exactly, it's undifferentiated. It's got the capacity to turn into any other type of cell. That's a great answer. So here, this experiment is really very simple. So I'm not going to show you too much data, but I think this is important for trying to see that this is computation. So here we can take one of these stem cells. It's got the capacity to reprogram. Depending what signals it receives, it will reprogram, and it can do lots of different jobs and, and differentiate. And this stem cell can differentiate into a fat cell or a, um, a nerve cell, a neuron, or a muscle cell, or a bone cell, depending on the signals it receives. But in this experiment, this was done by Dennis Disher's lab in, in America, this is a beautifully simple experiment, because everything is identical, and the only thing they change is the stiffness of this substrate. If they put the cell onto jelly, it becomes a fat cell, and if they put the cell onto glass, it becomes a bone cell. And in between, you get the different types. So the only thing changing here is the physical parameters, the physical stiffness of this um, matrix. So this cell's grabbed on. It's feeling it like that. And that ultimately leads to switching on the correct gene expression profile to become a completely different cell. So this is mechanical computation. And this is what we work to understand. How does that cell get those instructions to do that so fundamentally reprogram? And it leads to this notion that these small blue squares where this cell's grabbing on, those hands where it's pulling, is where this computation's occurring. It's grabbing on, and then it's using those attachments to learn what to do and to adjust. And if you look at those blue squares in a bit more detail, what you find is on the surface of every one of our cells, we have something called an integrin. These are receptors, and I don't want to go into too much detail about them, but they're essentially the hands of the cell. So each of our cells has got these hands which can grab on to this cargo net-like extracellular matrix. And in doing so, it can grab on, and then it can start to interrogate what it's attached to. But it can also use that grabbing on to stay where it is, or if you go to go ape or somewhere and you're climbing on the cargo net, for actually moving around by using this adhesion in a controlled fashion. So this is what we want to understand. And the memory molecules which we work on sit here just inside the cell so on the edge of all of our cells we've got receptors and then just inside we've got these proteins which have got this molecular me and mechanical memory i don't know if i did that did i turn that off i don't think i did because there's no oh here we go so yeah they've all got this attachment they grab on they can feel it but those um What it would be showing now, it would be showing those hands of the cell connected to the memory molecules, which are then connected to the cell's cytoskeleton, which is like the musculature, actin and myosin. I don't know if you're familiar, but when we lift anything, we've got muscles in our arm. They're made of motor proteins and actin. And in, in thank you, um, in our cells, we have exactly the same. Our cells have a musculature. They can, gen they can make these filaments, and they can pull, they can push. And they can, if you imagine that cell moving along, it's literally pulling itself forwards. So this is, the, this is where I think, as I'm going to show in a minute, this machinery, which is in those stem cells, is also the exact same machinery which is holding the synapses of our brain together. And this means that these molecules here are perfectly sensed to respond to forces, because if the extracellular, if the outside world changes, they can detect it. But if the cell can be given instructions to switch on its motors, it can physically pull on these memory molecules and change their shape. Um, but what's striking is this is four proteins, um, but they do many, many different jobs. So this computation is fundamental in all of our cells. So we already know that this is a migrating cell. Does anyone want to have a guess what's going on in this cell? In this cell, that's a, not, it's not a cell actually, but anyone wants to have a guess what's going on in this bottom corner? Yes, it is moving. So this is a um, this is the musculature, the muscles of um, a Drosophila, a fruit fly. It's what I say. 
Um, it's not elastication, this is literally the muscles in a fly. So you guys are hopefully too young to drink white wine. If you drink white wine in the summer, you'll almost certainly get a tiny little black fly in there. That's called a fruit fly. And they're incredibly powerful genetic models. And this is a fruit fly. It's an embryo of a fruit fly. It's just becoming contractile, so it's just clenching its muscles for the first time. But all this yellow streak is this same tailing, vincul tailing integrin and actin holding this together. Oh. And does, oh man. Right, does anyone know what's going on in this bottom corner? I heard it over there somewhere. It is mitosis, exactly right. And if you look what's going on in it, if it's gonna play, the cell starts off spread, it's grabbing on, but if you want to divide into two, if you're spread out really thin like a pancake, it's really hard to divide. So what the cell does is it lets go of all of its adhesions just as it's about to go. It goes into a ball and then it splits into two and then it immediately spreads out again. So this machinery, this computational machinery is playing a pivotal role in all of these jobs. But what we're most interested in is these connections in the brain. And I don't want to go into too much detail on the structure, but I want to just point to, we, this has been a long going project. I, I solved this in 2013 with a big team when I was at Leicester. And on the back of this, I set up my own research um, group to work on this molecule. But what happens is it grabs on at one end and it's got, all I want you to draw attention to is these 13 rod domains, they're called. These are bundles. And what we found 10 years ago was we identified that one of these was behaving like a switch. And by that, it was doing one job in, when it was closed, then you pulled on it and it changed. So what we've been doing over the last couple of years is trying to make videos to animate this, because I'm telling you something quite complicated, but a video is much more pictorial. So here's our tailing molecule, and it's getting pulled at this end. But what's happening in this video is that before you pull it, it's doing one set of jobs bound to this yellow protein. Hopefully it'll go again, here. But when we apply a mechanical signal, we, we pull, we change the binary switch, and in doing so, we change what it's doing. So the whole cell reprograms as a function of these mechanical cues. So if you could switch on the motor proteins inside of a cell, you can update the status, you can write information and change the shape of these molecules. And what I would set up my group to do was to understand how much force, how hard is the cell pulling? If it has to pull really hard, then it wouldn't ever happen. And if it happened without even pulling, it would be bad. Um, just as a, oh man, sorry, as a shout out, all of these videos are on my YouTube channel and they were made with a, um, a brilliant scientist called Sam Barnett who's just gone to work on um, the Million Genomes Project, no, 100,000 Genomes Project. But as a big plug for science, and hopefully you guys are here for science, so this is um, one of the, bit, STEM's a hard subject, but it's also so rewarding. And one of the beautiful things is it's truly inter international and we work here in Kent, obviously, but we collaborate with all of these different labs all around the world. So we're the world leaders in the biochemistry of these proteins, but then each of these is world leaders in what they do. So we work together to solve these complex problems and what I'm hopefully gonna show you today. But the next experiment was done in collaboration with the guys in Singapore. I go there every year to do these experiments. And this is the people who do it, Ming Chi and Ji, absolutely amazing scientists, they're biophysicists. And if you want to know how hard you need to pull on a single molecule, it's quite complicated because it's really, really small. But what these guys have developed is they've developed a technique to pull on individual molecules. And how you do it is you make a protein. So this is one protein. So anyone who remembers Avogadro's number, well, I don't know what it is, 10 to the 23. This is a single protein. But we attach it to a microscope by one end, and we attach a magnetic bead to the other end. And then we can pull on that using forces similar to what the cell can generate and watch what the protein does. And when we do that, you're pulling on, here we're just pulling on three switches. When you pull it, it gets stretched taut, but then you see these big jumps in extension. This is where these switches have opened. So here's switch one opening, switch two opening, switch three opening. And then you let go and it immediately resets and they close. So this is six cycles of opening and closing these switches. So this showed us for the first time that these are true binary switches in these proteins. And if you look at what the whole molecule looks like, this is where this gets really complicated. This is pulling 13 of these switches, and it's the same experiment where each of the, we, we're pulling on them, 
And as we increase the force, so anyone who does physics, they'll be working with pushing a, a weight across the table, or if you're lucky, you put it on, a, on wheels and put it down a ramp. But you're looking at Newton level forces. Here we're looking at minuscule picky Newton forces, which are what the cell can generate. So it can get an instruction, it can generate a picky Newton level of force. But each of these steps in this is one of these switches opening up. So this molecule is very, very, um, it's a series of switches and it's very changing its shape dramatically. But because each of these switches is binding to different proteins and different parts of signaling pathways, what's actually happening and what we're working on in the lab is that each of these steps is switching on and off different cellular programs. And this is this binary coding which we're interested in. And this is what I think is fundamental to all animal life. And this leads to this notion that this is memory that we're talking about because each time we pull on this, we can update it by opening once this thing's not happy at all. I haven't even got a keyboard to press skip on. Um, next slide, please. I was going to say on the COVID things. Um, Uh, here, uh, yeah. So each time we pull on this, we update this register, we update this string, this binary string, in a way controlled by the cells um, signaling. And if we pull, we open these, and if we relax slightly, we can close these. So this binary string is constantly changing and writing information into the shape of the molecule. And where this is exciting, why we're now um, full-blown neuroscientists, is that we're very interested because the, the synapses are held together by this complex um, connections between the pre and the postsynaptic side and the astrocytes and the glial cells but this is held together via these uh, memory molecules these tailings which are holding this together are around the edge of every single synapse so the considered to be purely scaffolding we now can show that these scaffolds have got um, these switches in them and then what leads to this idea that when you stimulate a synapse What's been shown by other researchers is that the motor proteins in the stimulated synapse gets pulled, gets, put, um, gets switched on. It pulls on these switches and updates the pattern of this, um, these ones and zeros. So this is truly binary information in the synapses. And so the idea we're trying to develop is that information is written into the shape of these molecules in like, actually how we write information to a computer disk. One of the things that requires is it requires that the brain is a mechanically perfect system because you're trying to do these tiny little forces. And for a long time, as a, as a mechanobiologist, it was considered that maybe the brain's not good for mechanobiology because it's a bit soft and it's a bit squidgy. But what that actually means is it's perfect because every single one of these synapses can build its own little um, environment perfectly isolated from all the others to enable this signaling and this mechanical computation to occur perfectly. So we're, very, we're working with, um, to actually look at this in, in brain slices and in different disease states, to actually read the shape of these molecules within um, samples of neurons. And that's the big idea behind the MeshCo theory. We've got this binary coding. We know that it's in every single synapse. And we know that the electrochemical signaling switches on the motor proteins. So the idea here is that these, this signaling changes the state of these switches, and then those switches change the activity of the synapse. And I'll skip through because I want to get to the question. So one of the things I really want to show is that like, this is what a, um, a, a synapse looks like, and this is something we're actually doing at the minute. We're physically measuring the, where the tailing molecules are, where one end of the tailing is and the other, and we're watching these molecules change shape within the synapses when we stimulate them. So here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but these green and these pink dots, this is the two ends of a tailing molecule within a, a dendritic spine. So there's four spines on this page, four synapses, and each tailing is in a different um, length. And that's shown as a cartoon here, that these different lengths of the tailing um, are spanning this whole thing. But what they're doing is they're positioning all the enzymes inside that, um, that isolated synaptic unit. And organizing them. So this is what we're measuring now, and this is what we really want to link to. We want to show that these lengths correlate to the activity, and that this is information written in there. But at least a model where if you've got two bits of a machinery, one which is static and one which you're moving, 
you can set different activation states. So you could imagine that by organizing these enzymes differently, you could have four of these um, spines on a single um, dendrite, but each one of them could have the enzymes organized differently as a function of this binary coding, such that they have different activation states, even though if we look with a microscope, they all look exactly the same. And you might just be starting to learn to drive now, but in the UK this works really nicely. Overseas, in America particularly, they've never heard of a crankshaft or whatever they call it, but we've got manual gears in this country, um, by and large, and how that works is that you use a stick to apply a force to move a, um, a mechanically operated part of the machinery. Does that mean we have to run out now? Um, relative to a static part. And in doing so, you put this into different settings and that gives different amounts of transmission. Exactly the same as what I think is going on here. You put this synapse into different settings and then you have different amounts of activity. And then as the signals go through, it'd be like changing the gear on that synapse. Each one would get dialed up and down. So if you could get on board with that, that you could write information into the synapse, if you have a really complex circuit of synapses, then there's an opportunity to write information in a, in a binary format into um, these circuits. And if you look at what the cortex of our brain looks like, where information is thought to reside, it has this incredibly boring repetitive structure where this is just my, I think we need a new battery on this thing for the next guy. Um, uh, this is three of these cortical columns. So the, the cortex of our brain is made up of 2,000 of these really repetitive units. But each of these red teardrops is a pyramidal cell. Each of these is making up to 60,000 synapses with its neighboring cells. And all of this is connected. I'm not even passing this. Um, all of this is connected to the hippocampus via this trunk wiring. Where this is exciting is if you look at what we've done over the last 20 years in designing ways to store information in silico, then the optimal way, so you can have a, um, a gigabyte or probably even a terabyte on a disk the size of your fingernail, is that those, SS, those SD cards, they have an arrangement which is, again is incredibly repetitive. It just repeats the same channel structure with these same flash and pages and blocks, but gives them all a different number. And then you just have an addressable. You say that information's on channel one, flash two, or whatever. And then you can call it back just by having an addressable um, memory. And that's what I think might be going on here. I think that all the information might be written in the shape of these molecules in this cortex in a way that's mapped by the hippocampus. And we call it. So you will, if I mentioned a kid's program you watched when you were six, you'll immediately recall it back, but you're not thinking about it all the time, hopefully. But that information's stored, and then you can just retrieve it instantly, within a second, and you call it back. Exactly the same with the disk. And I had to get my son to help me with this, because my maths isn't, isn't, isn't so good, but he's doing A-level maths. Um, so he worked out with the number of switches in the number of synapses, then there's a potential for 10 bet petabytes of data to be stored in this binary format within this cortical region. But it leads to some really interesting discussions because here's a guy who's about to go for a shower. It's, it's put his hand in. He's looking to see whether it's freezing cold, he'll come out. If it's really hot, he'll come out. But he's making a decision like on how much time he's got, what is, um, how hot it is, whether he could tolerate that, how cold it is. And what's happening is the sensory neurons in his fingers are being stimulated, and they send these binary pulses, these action potential spike trains, so like pulses of electricity, like down these um, what are essentially wires, through these synapses in the spinal cord and up to the brain to do the computation. But what's happened there is that this guy has received information and then updated himself um, or herself as a function of that. And this is just someone having a shower. But you could imagine taking this one step further where every single thing that happens to you Right, will be picked up via some sensory input in your eyes, your nose, your fingers, and fed into a computation. And it, I like to imagine that you could predict having an, an entire mathematical representation of that animal written into these switches as a function of every single stimuli it receives. And this would optimize it for its own unique life. We're lucky we've been born in where we are. We've got a very nice existence. If we were born in, in the North Pole or something, we'd have to get used to very different living. So you optimize from, with all this information written into this coding, optimizing these circuits. Is this going to work? So just as a few thoughts, 
then I hope they'll convince you that we've got memory molecules um, and that they're scaffolding our brains. It leads to this idea that they could be written to and perhaps each synapse in our brain can be specifically addressable by neural activity. You'd imagine that would be true. With a computer, we can address every single part. However, if that is the case, and you've got a petabyte of data, then it becomes really challenging to store and recall that information. So you must have some form of file allocation table. This is computer talk. But it doesn't matter whether you think the Meshko theory is right or you've got another pet theory in memory. Whatever your theory of memory is, you've got to have some form of file allocation table where, that in, where you've mapped out where that information is stored in your brain so that you can call it back when you need it. So this is, um, I think this is the hippocampus, and I think this is generally, cons the, the hippocampus is where the thinking, like the, com the central computer is, and then it calls to these different parts. And there's a huge amount of research to understand this. Like this is um, like with EEGs where you put the cap on your head and you read the electrical fingerprint. Like um, you can put one of those, a little tiny electrical cap on a mouse's hat, head and then you can watch it go about its daily work. And this is work done by um, this Dragoon guy. Um, but then you can measure the electrical fingerprint of what it learned in that day. And if you looked at it, it'd be spread over lots and lots of neurons and lots and lots of regions of the brain. But once it goes to sleep, there's this process called memory consolidation. And that's where it, it goes to sleep and it pulls out and it builds that information into the rest of the information. And the next day you look at that, the fingerprint, the electrical fingerprint and the synapses which are holding that information are, uh, are streamlined and reduced. And if you look at this and you think of this from a data model of using electrochemical signaling to switch on motor proteins to pull on memory molecules to update the binary code, then this looks exactly like how you do data management if you're running a database. So this is, um, this is off Wikipedia. This is um, the sleep cycle, when you go to sleep at night. And in the, co in the context of data management, this looks exactly like how you would build a database or rebuild it at night. And that when you first start, you don't do, if you're going to rebuild a database, pull all the information out and build it back in, you don't do that in the middle of the day where everyone in your company is using it because it will get really corrupted. You wait until there's hardly any act, action on it and it's not been used that heavily. And then you can start to move and manipulate that data. So what happens when you first go to sleep is that you go into very deep sleep, you let those calculations finish. But then you go through these cycles of what's called REM sleep where there's a huge amount of electrochemical activity and it looks like it's just like going almost like haywire. But in this model, that would be altering these um, switches, changing the route through the, um, the neural circuit by setting the activity of each of these synapses. And then you would go back into another period of deep sleep while you let that calculations finish and then you do it again and you'd have five cycles of this. So maybe you guys are too young to have done an all-nighter, but if you stay up working all night or going out all night, then the next day you're not working at optimum speed. And that's because you've not had time to process and um, sort all of that data, so your brain kind of gets fragmented. But the idea here is that if you get five cycles of this, then you can build what you've learned in that day into the structures and into the mappings of your thoughts in a way that then the next day it's just part of your lived experience. And then this is, um, in this, this is data management, I think. That's, I think that's why we have sleep. And I also think that's why sleep's essential. All animals sleep, and I think it is to enable this um, data management to occur. I think I'm out of time. But just to wrap it up, this sounds a bit crazy, but it came from an understanding and a discovery of molecules which have got memory, molecular memory, written into the shape of these switches. Experimentally, we can write strings of information into these molecules, by using these tweezers. We can actually control that and write distinct patterns. We can also read the shape of those molecules because we can use the things which bind to them. We can make fluorescent versions and read what shape that molecule's in by what proteins are stuck to it. And what I think is, this is based on biophysical principles. It's not based on any quantumness. It's not based on anything we don't yet understand. It's pure physics, just operating switches in a highly ordered structure. And I think it's completely consistent with all the other models where electrochemical signaling and the brain activity, which everyone knows, apart from here, it'd be updating where that electrochemical signaling is going, which synapses are active, which ones are not, in a way that encodes information. 
And I think what's important is that this identifies a read-write memory system. Again, it doesn't matter what theory of memory you, un you uh, is your favorite. Any form of complex computation needs a read-write memory system. You need to be able to hold a calculation while you do another calculation and put them together. You can't manage without a read-write memory system in any form of computation, which, as we know it. And I think altogether, then, that supports the view that this is an organic supercomputer, which we are using um, computer logic rules, which we're, uh, which we're also converging on, on our understanding of computers. So I want to finish there, and hopefully I'm not massively over time. Um, in particular, I want to thank Ji and Ming Chi in Singapore. We started this just as a curiosity, how hard to pull that switch. And it just opened up this whole vista. And every experiment we've done, and the papers which we're currently writing, um, it's just to totally transformed how we see it. And I think we're transforming how all of this is seen. I'd like to thank Sam um, for the nice videos which he helped me make, and the people who fund this research, including the Human Frontiers, and the guys in the lab. And thank you all um, for listening. <laughs> so that's an absolutely brilliant question. So I think that's why I called it a mesh code rather than just a tailing code, because tailing is the only one which has got 13 switches in series, which is coupled in all synapses. But there are other mechanical switches in other proteins, but normally only just one or two. So the, the, the tailing is the, the major one, but it binds to something called vinculin, which I showed at the start. It was actually the green in that cell which was crawling along. The greenness was because of vinculin. It's got six switches as well. So tailing and vinculin is what I think is. But yeah, there are other memory molecules are available. <laughs> but they just haven't got this complex switch pattern. Good question, though. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I hope I'm not around when we do, but yeah, I think, I think so, because I think, like there's a talk like with a, a C. elegans worm, which is one millimeter long, they've only got like 400 or 500 neurons, so you'd imagine that at some point we'd be able to fully simulate one of those, because they've only got like 100,000 synapses or something. At the minute, we're still establishing the rules, and we're trying to... As I showed, we're trying to see these shape changes in neurons and culture. We're trying to get this now the full connectomics of a worm is mapped. So we're trying to look for this in a worm to see it. But yeah, I'd imagine so. And also, maybe you could read this out. The, the big thing we don't know at the minute, which I don't go anywhere near here, is we don't know the operating system of a human. We don't know the format the data is written in. So there's still a long way to go, but yeah, I think, you, I think we could read it. And then there's a really amazing bit of science fiction on um, uploading and the first uploading of a person and the implications and the ethics of it. So yeah, I think, it, I think possibly, yeah. Hey. Yes. Are they like interfering with the kind of communication across the synapse with the teacher? Yes. So that's an absolutely wonderful question. So yeah, um, definitely the, the, um, the neurodegeneration is one of our main focuses because the main cause of the amyloid plaques is a protein called amyloid precursor protein that binds directly onto tailing. And one idea we're working on is that the, by the time you can see the plaques, the information was lost quite a long time before. The plaques are like a signature that it's happened. But maybe the information is getting scrambled and lost. Because if this, if this is a coding between neurons, if some of them start to get out of sync, it's like getting corrupted. The data is getting lost. So we're working on the idea that the knowledge is, the information is getting lost. And then you start to see the plaques. So we're hoping that we might be able to, if you can start to see it forming, to actually reduce that stage and slow Alzheimer's down by 20 or 30 years. If you slow it down by 30 years, then most people would have died by then. So yeah, but absolutely brilliant question. Hey. Do 
<laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope so. So we use this, um, uh, like the very common and popular in, in computing is the neural networks. Um, but they're quite, arti they're very artificial in fact, because they involve looking from above and not actually a proper true neural net. One of the things we're interested in is a quantized neural net where each node and each coupling has got discrete states. And then if you could have that and, and get the computation to work, then yeah, you could build much better computation because here it's not just that neuron talking to that neuron, it's that neuron talking to that neuron, but it's getting input from other neurons and then that gives the overall thing. So the amount of computation happening in a single neuron is really, really complicated. And then it's multiplexed by loads of neurons. So if we could build more information into each node of each connection in a neural net, then I think, yeah, definitely. Hey. Sorry, one more time with the microphone. Oh. Uh, what can this help with? <laughs> Like, can I help like AI or something? I don't know. Um, I don't know about with AI straight away, but possibly in 50 years. I think um, and with the computation and the, the rules of computation, I think we can, we'll hopefully make some progress on that. I, I, I'd also, I know I've finished, but one other thing which we're very interested in is that there's a, a type of child, I got contacted by Boston Children's Hospital because they've got a series of children who have got epilepsy and it's all caused by mutations in the tailing protein. So the idea is that, the, and they're all in the, where, the, where you pull on the protein. So the idea is that epilepsy might be caused because these synapses get out of sync because they're not pulled correctly. So we're really trying to hope that with Alzheimer's and epilepsy, we might find new ways to treat them as mechanical diseases. Hi. No, it's great. Um, so um, both, I think. So with epilepsy, you can normally tell where the foci is because it's, 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 it's stiffer. You can see the ECM is stiffened. So maybe they're getting bashed is stiffening that. Something else which is interesting is if you knock yourself out, which hopefully you haven't, you lose the last half an hour, but anything before that you kind of have. So there's obviously a time dependence on how this is written. The very short term memory, if you get a knock, um, then it gets scrambled and you lose that. And the same if you rub your eyes, you can see nice fireworks. It's like nice to do in exams when you're stuck. Um, then you see fireworks, you're mechanically stimulating those optic nerves and you're seeing it. So I think with the rugby players, yes, yeah, sustained banging and getting inflammation, which leads to a stiffening, which could then trigger the um, neurodegeneration for sure, yeah. Okay, so. Let's see. Yeah. Is there any evidence that if a tailin is destroyed, um, there's any redundancy within the synapse of that? <laughs> this memory is, this has been there? one of the best question and answers. Yeah, yeah, I think so, definitely. And that leads to an interesting thought process. It's actually by Francis Crick, who said it's hard to imagine memories stored in molecules because if the molecule gets turned over, then that information would be lost. So the idea we're working on is that the tailin molecules are part of this machinery which is moving back and forwards. But you could also imagine in the brain, we're not just writing to one bit. We might have like some sort of raid style thing where we write it, uh, almost like back it up or something. Because there's what bits where you lose damage to your brain, but then you can reconfigure some of that information. So it's all to be worked out. But yeah, I'd, I, I would predict that there is redundancy. Thank you all so much. I've firstly got a gift for Professor Gelt here. Oh, Say wow, thank you from the journal. Um, absolutely fantastic talk and some fantastic questions. It really was. As well. Yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah. So thank you. Bring thank you so much. Together. So, so much. <laughs> So Professor Galt will be staying to the break, so if you've got any more questions or want to talk to him individually, he'll be around at the break, so you can ask him any questions you might have then. Um, I think we're ready for our next speaker. Um, Dr. Dawes, um, I saw speak earlier this year at a symposium in London, um, won one of the prestigious Blavatnik Awards, um, and she's going to talk to us about antibody responses against pathogenic viruses. Okay? Well, thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Just wait for my slides. Ah. Okay.
Okay, so like I said, I'm a researcher at King's College London. There I run a lab where we look at neutralizing antibody responses to different pathogenic viruses. So we look at uh, antibodies to viruses such as HIV and SARS-CoV-2, which are probably things you've heard about, but we also look at antibodies to other types of viruses, including hantaviruses, flaviviruses, and arenaviruses. And these are all uh, zoonotic viruses. So these are viruses that can pass from animals into humans and cause disease. Uh, if this is a virus that hasn't been experienced by humans before, so the population is naive, then this can lead to severe um, disease in some cases. And this is what happened with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Oh, I have to do it this way. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, let me just get used to this. Okay, all right, so like I said, we look at antibody responses to these different viruses in the view of developing vaccines. So there's been a number of uh, pathogens which are biomedically important where vaccines have been developed and have been able to control a number of different diseases. So for example, Haemophilus influenza B, polio virus, and influenza virus. But one of the most successful vaccines that was ever developed was the smallpox vaccine. And this was developed from an observation by Edward Jenner that the milkmaids who, who uh, had been exposed to cowpox were infected with smallpox. And this idea that if you're exposed to one virus, then that would stop you from getting infected with another virus. And since the development of the smallpox vaccine, Previously, 300 million people have died, but there's not been any infections within the last 40 years. So this just shows you the power of vaccines in producing um, or eradicating viruses. And the thing that made the smallpox vaccine so effective was the fact that it produced these antibodies that could kill virus and prevent infection. So if we want to develop vaccines against different, against different viruses, we have to understand something about the pathogen or the virus so that we can know what to encode within these um, vaccines. Okay, so uh, we have to know about what types of proteins the virus has on the surface of, of, of its uh, surface, sorry. And, and we then can use this information to develop vaccines and, and these can be in many different formats. So things that you might be familiar with are killed virus vaccines or subunit vaccines or mRNA vaccines or viral vector vaccines. And there's been lots of development in terms of the platforms that can be used for developing vaccines. But really what we need to know about is the, the proteins that are in the surface of these viruses so that we know what to encode in these vaccine platforms. And all these vaccines would produce antibodies which then allow uh, the immune system to fight against these uh, pathogens in the future. So viruses have lots of things in common, but they also are, are different. So the things that they have in common are that they all have a protein coat, and this protein coat encapsulates the viral genetic material, which is the squiggly lines in the middle. So this can be either DNA or RNA. And this is the genetic material which allows, which encodes for the, which allows the virus to encode a new copy of itself. So once the virus has infected the cell, it can use its genetic material to produce a new version of itself and go on to infect more cells. Uh, viruses also, some viruses also have an envelope protein and the envelope, sorry, the envelope around the outside. And this is important for um, presenting the viral glycoprotein. And it's the viral glycoprotein that's important for interaction with the host receptors on target cells, which lead to infection. So if we want to understand more about how uh, a virus infects a cell and how we might develop a vaccine, it's important to understand the process by which the virus can enter the cell so that we can then target this in terms of vaccine development. So most uh, viruses will use a host cell receptor, which is shown here in blue, and it will interact with this um, with the receptor and it allows the virus to attach to the host cell. The glycoprotein then often goes changes in its structure, which allows it then to fuse with the membrane of the target cell. And this allows the virus then to enter into the cell. And once fusion has happened, the, the viral DNA is then um, enters into the cell and this allows production of new viruses. And this is where you have infection. 
So what, a, what happens in natural infection is that our immune systems will produce an antibody response against the virus, and these antibodies will typically bind to the surface glycoproteins on the, on the surface of the virus, and this will either directly inhibit the interaction with the host cell receptor, so act as a physical block stopping this from happening, but it can also bind to these glycoproteins on the surface and stop the conformational changes, so the protein from changing shape and allowing membrane fusion. And the point of vaccines is to expose your immune system to the proteins that we would see on the surface of the virus so that you can have produce these types of antibodies, create memory B cells so that if you are then exposed to this virus at a later date, that you will produce a quick immune response and prevent, on, uh, prevent a uh, infection in the future. Okay. So like I said, my lab's interested in studying antibody responses to pathogenic viruses. So when the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, the university was closed. But if we wanted to do SARS-CoV-2 research, we were allowed to stay and do that. So we decided we didn't want to sit at home doing nothing. So we started working with some of the clinical colleagues at St. Thomas's Hospital in London, where they had one of the largest intakes of uh, COVID-19 patients in the UK. And they were collecting different uh, serum samples, blood samples from patients, and um, we were helping them in diagnostics because at that point there was not very good diagnostics in the UK. But through this collaboration, we were able to start looking at the, what was the antibody response like in individuals who were infected with SARS-CoV-2. And this was an exciting time because not much was known about what was happening or what, what the immune response would be like to SARS-CoV-2 and what would be happening in the future. So we worked with our, the clinical colleagues and they were able to give us a large biobank of samples from SARS-CoV-2 infected people. And some of these patients were in hospital for a number of weeks and they were able to collect samples over a period of time, which allowed us to look at the kinetics of the antibody response following infection and also at the magnitude. So we had samples from different um, different patient groups. So we had people who were experiencing moderate to severe disease, which is going to be shown in the red line, but we also had samples from people who had mild or asymptomatic disease. These were often the uh, doctors in the hospital. And we were, like I say, we were able to look at the kinetics and the magnitude of the response. So here we showed that following the infection, you saw a peak in the antibody response. So you can see the response is rising. And then after a period of time, we saw a decline in the antibody response and this waned to a, cer to a certain extent. And this was true of both the individuals who had very severe disease, but also the individuals who had mild or asymptomatic disease. So this is what you would classically expect in an acute viral infection. So this was reassuring that actually in infection, we're producing the normal type of antibody response. But you can see that the response has waned over time, and this suggest, suggested that actually vac um, immune responses might not be long lasting, and in terms of vaccine responses as well, that you might need to have uh, regular boosting, and this is actually what has come on, what we now see in uh, as the pandemic continues. So we also compared the peak of the antibody response between those who were experiencing mild disease and those who are experiencing severe disease. And you can see that the peak of the response was much higher in those who had severe disease compared to those who had mild disease. So this might seem a little bit counterintuitive because you might think those who are more ill will have a better, would have a worse antibody response because they haven't got the antibodies present. But actually, those who were more ill had a higher amount of virus in their body, which was making them ill. And this provided more stimulation to the B cells, which produced more antibody. But by the time the antibody had been produced, the disease was already bad. So they produced a better response, but the response was too late. So that's one of the benefits of vaccination is that you can have the response coming up quicker um, rather than in a primary infection where it takes longer. But you can see that those who had mild or asymptomatic disease did produce fairly good antibody responses. So it was assumed that when you had a mild disease, you would still have some level of protection in the future and wouldn't necessarily go on to have a severe disease if you're infected again. So we also wanted to understand a bit more about the types of antibodies that the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS infection might produce. So in my lab, we use a technique called antigen-specific B cell sorting. So here on the left, these are examples of memory B cells. And you can see on the surface, they have a B cell receptor. And each of these, each 
B cell encodes a specific B cell receptor, which is specific for a particular viral antigen. So we can select these specific cells using a technique called flow cytometry. And we can isolate one individual cell in one individual well of a 96 well plate. And from there, we're able to clone and sequence the antibody that's present and then do some um, in-depth analysis of where these antibodies bind. So doing this, we were able to isolate over 200 different monoclonal antibodies from SARS-CoV-2 uh, convalescent donors. And you can see here showing a different epitopes that we identified on the surface. So these are specific areas, an epitope is a specific area on the glycoprotein where these antibodies bind. So you can see that there are lots of different uh, places on there. And the reason why this is important is because we can then start identifying domains on the protein which are particularly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. And as you might be aware that during the pandemic, the virus started to mutate and we started getting variants of concern. So there was the alpha variant, the beta variant, the delta variant, and then more recently, the Omicron variant. And what we've been able to do is to map onto the structure of the protein where the mutations are arising. And we can see that the mutations are actually arising in the positions where the antibodies are binding. So the antibodies are putting a selective pressure on the virus leading to changes. So now we have a map of where antibodies are binding, and as new variants arrive, we can start looking at where the um, mutations are and start uh, making an assessment of whether we think variants are gonna be particularly concerning in terms of immune escape, or that they won't be um, so concerning. So as you're probably aware, there was quite rapidly a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine produced, and it rolled out across the world, and that kind of allowed us all to get back to normal life. You might ask a question, well, how is it that we were able to develop, or scientists were able to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine so quickly, yet there's still no HIV vaccine? Researchers have been working on this for over 30 years, and we still have no vaccine. So this is something that I've been working on prior to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, and it's a question I get a lot um, from friends and family. How come, what, what's going on? So for the next bit of the talk, I want to talk a bit about why HIV is more difficult and the avenues that people are investigating for HIV vaccine development. So some people might think that an HIV vaccine is not really needed anymore because we've got antiretroviral therapy, but in the, the developing world, a vaccine is really needed to reduce the number of new infections that are occurring each year. So there's a, a, a large amount of researchers working in this area trying to pursue an HIV vaccine. So HIV has a number of different challenges compared to SARS-CoV-2. So the first thing is that HIV is a retrovirus. So that means that the genetic material, so the RNA material, which is encoded by the virus, when the virus enters the cells, the RNA gets reverse transcribed into DNA. And then the enzyme, the, sorry, the virus encodes an enzyme called integrase. And this enzyme then integrates the viral DNA into the, the DNA of the cell. So it becomes part of the, the genetic material of the cell. So once someone becomes HIV infected, they are infected for life, unless you can remove every single HIV infected cell from the body, which is difficult to do because HIV infection also leads to a latent infection. So often the cells that are infected are present in the body, but they've got no uh, viral antigen on the surface. So the immune system can't actually realize that the, the cells are infected. So one of the main challenges for an HIV vaccine is that the vaccine has to stop every single cell from ever being infected. And you might be aware from yourself or other people that even though many people have had the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, they've, or they've had infections. So although the vaccine has stopped serious disease, it hasn't actually given sterilizing immunity. So that type of vaccine would not be effective for HIV. Um, so the other, uh, one of the other challenges in terms of HIV is, is the glycoprotein that's in the surface of the virus. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we refer to that as the spike protein, but here we refer to the HIV glycoprotein as the envelope glycoprotein. So this protein has a number of challenges associated with it. It looks very beautiful there, but it's a crafty thing. Um, so the first thing is, Oops, is that the protein is highly variable. So we talked about how when the virus enters the cell, it, the genetic materials as an RNA, but it has to be reverse transcribed into DNA. But the enzyme that the virus uses to do that has no proofreading ability. So you might have a series of nucleotides, but if there's a mutation made in the reverse transcription stage, 
it can't check that there's an error that, that there's an error so basically every time the virus replicates it introduces lots of errors and this leads to very rapid um, accumulation of mutation so to demonstrate this I'm going to compare here HIV the var variability in HIV versus influenza so I don't know if you can see very well and the point is not working but in the top uh, left hand side they can see a, a blue arrow and a tiny yellow dot that yellow dot represents the level of diversity of influenza in the outbreak in 1997 in Canada. So the length of the line represents diversity. So you can see a tiny dot, so very little diversity. Beneath it is the level of diversity in influenza in 1996 in the global outbreak. Again, it's now a bit of a splodge, but it's not particularly very much diversity. But if we compare this to um, HIV in the top uh, right, as the level of diversity in a single person who's been infected with HIV for six years. You can see there's a similar level of diversity between the global outbreak of flu and one person. Now, if you start looking at bigger populations, you can see the diversity in Amsterdam in 1990 to 91, or the Congo in 1997, you can see the diversity is ginormous. So any vaccine that you have to that we're going to produce needs to be able to produce antibody response that will target all the different all the different types of viruses or strains we call them of HIV and be effective against all of those so we think about again going back to SARS-CoV-2 we've got the different variants the alpha the beta the delta the omicron but that's more like up in the flu section rather than down here so that's one of the biggest challenges and this uh, image here is supposed to represent the what that di diversity might actually mean in terms of the protein so again this is comparing the glycoprotein structure HIV, influenza, and RSV, and it's color-coded based on diversity. So if it's white, it's very conserved across different viruses that you, you isolate from people. But if it's purple, it's very variable. So you can see in HIV, it's very variable. Flu is also very variable when you look at it in that respect. But RSV is not variable at all, and there are, is an RSV vaccine for adults in the US. So that's one of the challenges. Then the final challenge I wanted to highlight was that the envelope protein of HIV is covered in sugars. So um, these are shown in green. So these basically form a shield across the protein surface, which prevent antibodies from binding to um, the protein underneath and act as a shield and therefore make it difficult to produce antibodies. So these are all things which are particularly challenging in terms of developing an HIV vaccine. So if we want to develop an HIV vaccine, what should it look like? So it should be 100% effective and provide sterilizing immunity. And that's probably the biggest challenge. It has to be active against all the different isolates in the target population. So it has to accommodate all that variability. But also when thinking about the, the, um, the types of populations that will be needing this vaccine, it needs to be long lasting and have a simple vaccination schedule, which is has been improved with the COVID-19 vaccines because rollout, large rollout of vaccines has been optimized. Um, so that is less of a challenge these days. So I've painted a very negative picture, but what can be done about this? Um, so researchers across the world have been looking at people who are HIV infected and who have been infected for over three to five years. And what, if you look at these populations, you can see that some individuals about 10 to 30% of people do produce antibodies that would be active against all these different strains. So it shows us that the immune system has been able to overcome all these challenges and can produce the types of antibodies that you would want in a vaccine setting. So by looking at uh, individuals from all these different countries, we can find people where they're making the antibodies that we want to produce in a vaccine. Um, so how does that actually help us? So in the HIV field, people are using an approach called reverse vaccinology. So it's the idea that you have a person who's producing the antibodies that you would like to produce in a vaccine setting, but then by isolating those antibodies from the people and studying how they interact with the viral glycoproteins, that you can then design an immunogen that would then try to re-elicit those antibodies through vaccination. So it's like it's reverse because you're take, you know what you want to do, you just need to work out how, how to do it. And this sounds very simple, but it's not been as simple as people think. But some progress has been made. So again, using the technique that I was talking about before, antigen-specific B cell sorting, we can isolate specific monoclonal antibodies from chronically infected HIV patients. 
we've been isolate, able to identify a number of different antibody epitopes on the surface of the envelope glycoprotein. And these antibodies can neutralize up to 90 to some of them 98% of different circulating HIV strains. The issue is, is that it's taken the person three to five years to develop these types of antibodies under chronic infection. So the research is now trying to look at how we can develop vaccination schedules that would mimic what's happening during the natural infection. But just as a proof of principle to show that, the, that this approach would work if we could generate those types of antibodies during um, vaccination, this is a study done uh, a number of years ago with some of the monoclonal antibodies that we isolated. So in this experiment, what you do is you take some macaques, so these are a type of monkey, you passively administer the monoclonal antibody to the animal, you then try to infect them with a type of HIV which can infect macaques, and then you look at whether they become affected. So you're trying to show, we're trying to show that the antibodies that we'd isolated could stop infection. So on the bottom right hand side in red, this is the control experiment where we gave the monkeys an antibody that's not specific for HIV, it's actually specific for dengue virus. And you can see when you challenge the animals, the, the graph goes up. This is the viral copies. So you can see that when you give a non-specific antibody, all the monkeys get infected. However, when you give a different, uh, different doses of the antibody in the blue, the green, and the purple, you can see that the antibody is ab actually able to stop infection of the animals. So this gives the proof of principle that if you can produce these antibodies through vaccines, you would be able to stop um, infection. So what are different approaches are we using to develop um, vaccines? So this is the sort of pipeline that we're using in various uh, EU and um, US consortiums. So if you look at the arrows along the middle, so we isolate the monoclonal antibodies. We're using structural biology to look at how they interact with the glycoproteins. We then design immunogens that we think might re-elicit these antibodies through vaccination. We then screen them in small animal models and look at what the antibody responses are, are they producing the antibodies that we want, or do we need to go back and optimize the immunogens? So we then have different feedback loops. So ultimately, we'll lead to a vaccine, but this is a, a slow process, and it's something which is being investigated by lots of scientists um, th throughout the world. Okay. Oops. So, like I mentioned, we're also interested in other emerging zoonotic pathogens. So these are, like I said, viruses that pass from animals into humans and cause disease. And this is something which is becoming more and more, or potentially be could become more and more of an issue as time goes on. One is that humans are encroaching into the, uh, into the habitats of animals through various lifestyles, so through cutting down trees, uh, in, um, expanding populations in certain countries. And there's lots of different animals that, that can uh, transmit viruses. So, for example, we have birds, which you know for the bird flu, bats particularly relevant, but also cattle, so camels and, and um, sheep and cattle in Africa, but also mice, things like bank voles can um, spread disease. So if we encroach into their environment, that can be bad. But also, due to global warming, their, their, uh, the habitat of those types of animals is also changing. So a lot of these viruses can transmit via mosquitoes. So for example, some types of mosquitoes which spread malaria are often found in Africa, and they're starting to be found in, south, in Southern Europe. So as, glo as global warming changes, then the habitats of these, of these animals also change and the, and the reservoirs. So when thinking about preparing for the next pandemic, it's really important to have a good idea of what types of viruses are, being are the, these types of animals being infected with, because the more we know about them now, the better prepared we can be um, in the future. I don't know why. Can you do the next slide? Sorry. Oh, there we go. So how might we future-proof in thinking about um, the next vaccines? So when we think about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, again, we go back to this idea that, wow, it was so quick, everyone managed to produce these vaccines so quickly. But actually, a lot of work had been done in the past. So in 2003, there was the SARS-CoV-1, or the SARS-CoV outbreak, the coronavirus-1 outbreak. And a few years later, there was the MERS coronavirus outbreak. And lots of research was going on with those um, viruses since then. So for example, researchers had spent a lot of time working out, this is a, here's a picture of the spike protein 
represented the spike protein from coronaviruses. But they spent lots of time studying the spike protein. They'd worked out how to take this protein and introduce specific amino acid mutations that would stabilize the protein and produce a really good um, antig antigen for vaccine development. They'd worked out which, where, uh, this protein bound to the receptor on host cells, so they knew which particular areas were of a particular interest in terms of developing vaccines. So the more we can know about different emerging viruses now, the better prepared we can be in the future for developing um, vaccines. So one strategy that we use in my lab is try to, we group viruses together in related, because they're related to each other, and then we try to find the epitopes, so antibody binding sites on those that are shared between multiple related viruses. So I'm representing that here. So these would be, for example, all types of bat coronaviruses that maybe have the potential to pass into humans. So we try to identify epitopes which could be uh, shared across all of them. And then with the assumption being that there may be an unknown variant that turns up and it may also share this um, this epitope on there and that way we could take vaccines that we already know from vaccines from viruses that we already know about and use them against newly arising ones also if we can identify these types of shared epitopes we can develop monoclonal antibodies against them and there's been lots of interest in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in terms of using monoclonal antibodies as a therapy and as a treatment so if we can have a whole panel of antibodies ready that might potentially interact or neutralize viruses, new viruses that pass into the human population, then we, we, we would have a good toolkit to fight against the next pandemic. So these are some of the areas of research that we have at the moment. So I've left lots of time for questions. Uh, so to summarize what I've um, been talking to you about today, antibodies are an important, have a very, very important role in successful vaccines. So it's important to study antibody responses in infection and vaccination to inform. Uh, knowledge of the viral surface glycoprotein gives insight into immunogen design. So if we don't know what the surface glycoproteins are, we can't even start to think about developing vaccines. But also antibody responses in natural infection can be a really good template for starting to develop vaccines against more challenging um, viruses. So this just leads me to thank people in my research lab in London who work very hard on these projects and also different research funders, and I'm happy to take any questions from you. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, um, just wait for me to get to them in the microphone and then feel free to ask them. Anyone got any questions? Yeah. Um, hello. Um, with regards to HIV, has there been any studies into using those monoclonal antibodies either in conjunction with or as a replacement for antiretroviral anti drugs as a form of post-exposure prophylaxis? Yeah, so in both respects. So people have been used, well, some people have used it for a pre-exposure prophylaxis and some people have used it for a post-exposure and they've also been investigators and alternative for antiretroviral therapy. So the main limitation with using them for an antiretroviral therapy or any of those is that the half-life of them is very short. So they only have, you would have to administer new antibody every seven to, I think it's every seven to 10, 10 days, but because of the way you administer it, you have to infuse IV, which is something which is not so easy to do. But re what researchers are trying to do is to make mutations in the FC part of the antibody, which reduces the interaction with receptors in the body, which reduces the clearance from the immune system. So it's, a, it's an approach that people use in the cancer therapy field as well. So people have now been able to increase the half-life to six months. So it is something that people are using as a treatment. So the one thing you have to do is because the virus is able to mutate quickly, the approach is that you would give a cocktail of different antibodies. So I don't remember on the picture, there were different areas highlighted. So you would give a cocktail of three different monoclonal antibodies against different epitopes to reduce the escape, which is what they do with antiretroviral therapy. That is being investigated, yep.
I don't know if it was the AstraZeneca one or the Pfizer one, but why is it giving people blood clots like the uh, COVID vaccine? Sorry, say again. Why is it giving people blood clots? Why does the COVID vaccine give people blood clots? Yeah. So I guess that was the that was the AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm not exactly sure I can answer that question. Sorry. It was in a very small number of people. Yeah. Um, I heard of a case where there was a, I think it was a Chinese scientist who used CRISPR during an IVF process to make sure that the um, developing fetus would be resistant to HIV. And I think it ended up working. But do you think that there's a potential for that to even be like ethical or possible as a preventative treatment in the future? Okay, yeah, so this is quite a, uh, a, a, a bad thing that the, <laughs> the people did in China. So basically, for HIV to infect a cell, you need to have... Uh, the receptor CD4, and then you have the C CXCR4, CCR5. So some people naturally have a mutation in the co-receptor, which is CCR5, which stops them from getting infected. So in in there's been a few cases of two cases of people who've been cured of HIV, and what they had cancer as well, and they had a bone marrow transplant, and the cells, their CD4 cells, were replaced with cells which lacked or had a mutation in CCR5, so they couldn't then be reinfected. So they were then cured. So that led to this study where in China, uh, there was a scientist who, without ethical approval, <laughs> genetically modified the embryos, two embryos, and put in the CCR5 mutation, which meant that the children would never be able to become HIV infected. He was then subsequently arrested and put in prison because it was illegal. But anyway, <laughs> that's a very, very extreme case of trying to stop people becoming HIV infected. So I think in the long term, it's not going to be a solution to the problem. It is something which is interesting scientifically. But like with the curing of people with HIV, they've tried to do this bone marrow transplant with cells that were resistant to HIV in a number of different patients. And there's only been two people that it's worked for. And it's incredibly expensive and actually quite a risky procedure. I mean, they were their cancer was very extreme. So it does work, but I think there are better ways to prevent <laughs> to prevent HIV infection than genetically modifying embryos. Yes. Um, relating back to COVID, is there a reason why some people like suffer from long COVID? Is that because of their body's like general response, like the general immune response? Or is it because of a delay in taking the COVID vaccine? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the problem with long COVID as a term, long COVID, it seems to be, or the opinion I think now is that it's a number of different syndromes that are happening and the particular biological mechanism for them are not fully understood entirely. But it's not necessarily connected with how severe the disease was when you had when you were COVID inf infected at the time. And it, for a time, it was thought that if you had a COVID-19 vaccine afterwards, it might minimise symptoms later on. But that doesn't seem to follow in larger studies. And it was also thought maybe it was to do with residual virus in the body that hadn't been cleared. But again, it doesn't seem that that is the case. So there's a lot of research going on in that area, but I think it's going to be a long time still till they get answers but there is evidence in other viral infections of sort of long long-term viral effects and things it's not something necessarily just specific to SARS-CoV-2 it is a general theme of viruses but it's but because so much of the population got infected all in one go I think it's making it much easier to see and find trends and things like that yeah So if viruses have to bind to cell receptors in order to gain entrance to the cell, and there's only a limited number of cell receptors, is there like a common region to every single virus protein that binds to a certain receptor? And can you develop antibodies that target that region, that targets a very large range of viruses? Yeah, so I guess if, so different types of viruses will use different types of receptors. So there is quite a global a global type, a, a global, uh, sorry, quite a wide range of different receptors that can be used, that can be used. And some viruses require multiple receptors, like HIV requires a receptor and a co-receptor. But there are examples where people are trying to target the receptor with an antibody to stop infection. The problem is, is that sometimes these viruses use proteins which are actually really important for other processes. So you don't want to necessarily knock down the activity of that receptor 
the virus receptor because it might be a protein that's important for something else in the body. So if that was going to be your approach, it would need to be some sort of acute infection because you, in the long term, you wouldn't want to be continually targeting a host protein with an antibody. But for, for example, for SARS-CoV, for coronaviruses, I know some scientists are investigating antibodies or proteins which bind really strongly to um, the ACE2 receptor, which is important for uh, infection of SARS-CoV-2. Yep. Two more questions, if anyone has any. You mentioned with like HIV, it requires co-receptors and receptors, and it has that shield, which makes it so tough to develop a vaccine for. Is that something that the virus naturally had, or is it something that it kind of developed over time as like a selection pressure to make it really tough to develop that vaccine? So I guess, so HIV was originally a virus that had, had zoonos from macaques and monkeys in Africa. So that is, it will have it does evolve over time, but it hasn't evolved to have no glycans then to have glycans. But you can see if you track the evolution of viruses in people that the position of where those glyc glycans sit on the envelope protein do move around. So it seems to be a specific mechanism that it's using. Um, I don't, but not necessarily something that it did and then didn't have yet. Um, I'm just wondering, do you think that the development of, um, well, vaccinations against certain viruses is slowed down due to like prejudice, for example, like with HIV, do you think prejudice against gay people and minority groups like slow down the development of vaccinations? I, mean, I, I think more maybe anti-vaxxers might slow down the development of vaccines. I mean, in the HIV field, that um, people are really people infected with HIV are very encouraging of research and they're always very willing to get involved. So it's reached a kind of a tricky point, HIV vaccine research, in the sense that antiretroviral therapies, if available and used properly, can mean that people have no virus detectable in their body, which means they then can't pass it on to other people. So then to do, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, so giving antiretroviral therapy prior to exposure to HIV, is also really efficient if drugs are available and are taken as instructed. So there's a lot of ethical problems now about whether it's actually ethically okay to do a vaccine trial for HIV, where you might have a vaccine that works 50%, but actually the, the pre-exposure prophylaxis will work 100%. So is it ethically okay to give something that you know is not as good as something when there's alternatives? So that is the more likely to slow down vaccine development. But actually there's a lot of research now in, with animal models and there's lots of information in terms of correlating the animal model with the human data. So improving that type of thing will speed things up more. Yeah. Just say again a huge thank you uh, to Dr. Dawes and coming to talk to us. Um, really interesting about something, you know, obviously a huge impact on all our lives in the last um, few years to learn more about it. Um, we've got the break now. Very quick couple of notices, um, just so you know where you're going after that. To remind you, if you're from Dover Grammar School, Kent College or Langton Girls, you're going to the school room. There are two sessions, then you'll have lunch. If you are from Langton Boys, the Judd School or Canterbury Academy, you're going to the new science auditorium for three talks and then you will have lunch. We're so staggering lunch across two sessions. And if you are watching online, the next uh, set of sessions will not be live streamed, but they will be recorded for you to catch on, on later. Um, then we've got the student presentations and the panel later on, which will again be live streamed. So uh, the break is downstairs in the Pupil Social Centre. If you either go out that front door and go round that way, you can go in or around the back door and around that way. We have students around to guide you if you get lost. Enjoy and see you in half an hour. <laughs>